This past week, somebody tried to assassinate Donald Trump. Republicans seized on the event to blame their usual targets like women and DEI. What I find more interesting is those Republicans and Democrats who've taken the time to decry political violence. Violence, they've been saying sanctimoniously, has no place in politics. Political violence is unforgivable and undemocratic. As Melania says, politics is about love and uplifting our communities. Seems a bit of a pivot, though, doesn't it? This messaging comes on the heel of a decade of Republicans screaming for more violence against their various enemies. The overall message seems to be violence by Republicans is necessary and righteous and bountiful, while violence against Republicans is obviously morally wrong. Democrats have shown their asses by agreeing with these premises, saying how they wish Donald a speedy recovery because he's such a wonderful guy, really. What all these people know that you might not is violence is to politics like cells are to your body. You might not see it, but... It's how stuff gets done. To say violence has no place in politics is to fundamentally misunderstand politics. I'm gonna do my best to make it a bit clearer. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the channel for students, teachers, and dropouts alike. This channel is sponsored by Missile Money. It's like that other money app, but when you use Missile Money, you get a bit of a unique cryptocurrency you can use to buy a shoulder-launched missile. Too many police helicopters in your city? Missile Money. Politics is a negotiation over how to develop divide and wield power. Power is applying violence for one's own purposes. Politics is a contest for control of the offices of the state. It's widely believed in a system that calls itself a democracy, the people can affect politics through voting and just generally making their voices heard. But as I've explained in a hundred different ways, that belief is largely unfounded. Most people are permanently locked out of politics. All they can do is vote and hope their vote isn't wasted and hope their preferred party comes to power and hope it does what they want them to, then argue with people about it every day and hope it changes their minds. But politicians work for the people who fund their electoral campaigns. The people with all the money write the policies and select and fund the candidates they like. When does the democracy happen? But what is the point of power? Why do people want to control the state? One big reason is the state monopolizes governance or the making and enforcing of laws. So lobbyists working for the richest people with the biggest corporations ensure politicians pass the laws they're told to. You make the laws, you can regulate your own industry, favoring your own firm and locking others out of the market, deciding for yourself how much pollution is legal and acceptable, crushing union power and worker protections, and so on. And how are laws implemented? with a threat. Let's get philosophical. What is violence? Everyone seems to know, but the line between what is violent and what is not is in a different place depending which angle you're looking from. If I attack someone, that's violence, right? What if I just threaten them? The threat is the real power. If I wanted power over a person, I would only attack them to make them think I'll do it again if I don't get what I want. So is a credible threat violence? What about violence that's purely defensive? Is it still violence? I guess that depends if your definition of violence includes an element of morality. It probably does, since for the most part we tend to frown on anything that could be called violence because most of us by default consider most people on our level, equal to us in basic humanity, and initiating force against someone subordinates that person to the one using force. But what if I attack someone preventively? If someone says they want to kill me and I believe it, then I kill them. Is it violence? What if I killed someone who was trying to kill someone else? What if they were going to kill thousands of people? Is that violence? And if so, is it wrong? What about legal violence? Is legal violence violence? Is it legitimate because it's legitimate? Let's talk about what's legal. What if someone dies because they have no money for life-saving medicine? The medicine might be right there, just on the other side of the glass. But it's behind the legal wall of property, which means it's protected by the full might of law enforcement. People die because they can't afford medicine every day. And yet we never call it violence. It never gets blamed on the complicated structural factors that cause it. Why is it okay to let people die because someone else won't let them have what they need. Because it's the law. 
The law is the threat of punitive action by the enforcers of the law. Even when acting outside the bounds of the law, the police are empowered by the law to use any kind of violence to impose the state's policies. Overt state violence is the exception rather than the rule, but the implicit violence of law enforcement shapes everything we do and everywhere we go, as I explained in my last video. Every aspect of life is regulated by law, so it's affected by state violence. Permitted behaviors are largely limited to studying, working, and shopping. Most people don't think of violence as systemic, but individual. We've been conditioned not to see systemic violence and blame individuals for their misfortune. But if there's no systemic violence, why is it some people own pretty much everything and most people barely even own their own homes? Systemic violence keeps those property relations in place by punishing anyone who threatens them. I've made a whole series on how this situation came to be, which you can check out here. But the short answer is, over the past few hundred years, the ruling class has spread the capitalist model around the world. And to do so, it had to dispossess everyone it wanted to force into the labor pool. Property owners came to own everything of any value, to the point where today most of what we need to survive is owned by a few huge corporations. But I'll let you check out that series if you want to talk about history. This video is about violence in the present. Is it violence when a guy in the street pulls a gun on you and makes you hand over your wallet? If so, what about when the boss steals from your paycheck and there's nothing you can do? What about when the police rob you? Even a fine could be considered violent, because if you can't pay, police can take your stuff, meager as it probably is. How about evictions? Are evictions violence? Is there nothing violent about forcing people out of their homes and into the street? As a property owner, the landlord retains the right to unleash the police on you if you don't go peacefully. Is there nothing violent about the constant threat of police if you enter any building to try to sleep there? What if, after you lost your home, you smashed the windows of the landlord of the bank that took it? Would that be violence? Should the people who make and enforce the laws be the only ones who get to decide what constitutes legitimate violence? If so, we've set up a double standard. The violence of law enforcers has to be justified as necessary to prevent the same kind of violence among civilians. You can't go around harassing and assaulting people because that's the monopoly of the police, though I hope that's not the only reason you don't do it. You can't legally kidnap people and put them in cages and ruin their days or their lives like the police can. You can't stop people moving around the world just because they don't have the right papers with the right stamps on them, unless of course the enforcers turn a blind eye. You can't kill people and then get punished with two weeks of paid leave, unless you're a cop. Although, even a civilian might get a pardon for killing the right people in the right place. I've also heard there are some wars going on. Is it wrong to drop bombs on people who can't defend themselves? If so, you are obviously opposed to Israel's war on Gaza. Is it violence to kill 100,000 people? To leave children under rubble next to their dead parents? To attempt to starve 2 million people? I'm gonna go out on a limb and say yes. Is it violence to send Israel the weapons to massacre civilians? If so, you presumably also oppose US foreign policy, which sends billions in military hardware to Israel every year, which it uses. This guy says there's no place for political violence. What kind of violence is it when you send drones around the world to bomb weddings and schools and rescue missions? But maybe Barack doesn't consider droning people political since it had bipartisan support. Once something has been approved by the government, it's no longer immoral. Yeah! Is taking billions of dollars from people in taxes to pay for weapons violence? Well, how do they take taxes? With the threat of force. If you don't pay to send weapons to kill Palestinians, you're committing a crime. You could have your business, your home, everything taken away from you for following your conscience. So we're immersed in the violence of the state. A lot of it is invisible, but just as real as the violence we hear about. I keep hearing resisting this violence, even when you're a victim of it, should be completely non-violent, and your cause and methods are only legitimate and will only be effective if you go through the proper legal channels. I strongly disagree. While I think resistance should be strategic, which we'll talk about in my next video, I understand angry outbursts and drastic responses too. 
This system pushes people to breaking point. People are legally supposed to sit and watch as their loved ones get carted off to prison or another country or the cemetery. But I want to help them do something about it, then to stop the process permanently and let people live how and where they want. Is an assassination attempt violence? Let's go with yes. Is mass deportation violence? Yes, and on a much larger scale. An assassin just wants to remove one person. Forcing people to leave their homes because they're not white like you is ethnic cleansing. It's evicting people from a whole continent because you don't like what you've heard they're like. The deporters might not have to physically attack anyone because everyone knows they come with the threat they can do basically anything to these people with impunity. And by the way, they do. During the cleansing process, sexual assault is such a regular occurrence, you could call it the pastime of many in border enforcement. This news shouldn't be too surprising if you realize the reason people take jobs like border guard, the reason they want power over others, is so they can use it. I don't know why that guy shot at Trump, but I know what it looks like when chickens come home to roost. Republicans are now saying violence is wrong because someone attempted to assassinate the spiritual leader of their movement. But they've always preached violence. Now they plan to use the full force of the state to kill, incarcerate, and deport, well, anyone who doesn't own property. Which I'll admit might be what the founders of the US always intended. But the right wing has become explicit in the past eight years or more in how much they want to hurt people, how much contempt they have for the people around them, how little they value their lives, and how much they want to remove them from the US by force. If you haven't been listening to right-wingers on social media or at their conferences, you might not be aware of what they want to do and how wild their conspiracy theories have become. But it's never too late to start paying attention. This year, like many years before, the Heritage Foundation put out a paper of policy recommendations for the Republican Party platform. The paper is consistent with the party's current trajectory towards what's being called Christian nationalism because people don't like to use the word fascism. If you've heard of Project 2025, or if you just listen when they talk, you might know the Republican Party and its orbiters have declared war on people with uteruses, people with melanin, people without documents, and even people with documents. People with jobs, people with a different religion, people whose gender expression or sexuality they find icky, and anyone not happy with these arrangements. At what point can it be said they are planning extreme amounts of violence against the most vulnerable people? At what point is it okay to resist? The Republican Party has a smooth, open road to power provided by the electoral system. That system we learned in school keeps out the authoritarians. So long as their promises to hurt people are popular enough, and if no one stops them, they will turn the US into a new fascist state. It's all there in black and white. They're promising fascism. They're just not using the word. Fascism, by the way, is when the state does to white people what it's always done to black and brown people. The right wants to harm millions more people than are already being harmed by the system and make it all legal. From what they've been saying, I don't think Republicans will recognize the outcome of the vote if Trump loses. I'm old enough to remember the Supreme Court decided all on its own that George W. Bush won the 2000 election because there was a little confusion. So the court had to ignore all the votes in your democratic system. And if they take the White House and the Congress by whatever means this year, do you think they'll then give up power peacefully again if they lose four years later? Is that how fascist governments usually end? Is it acceptable yet to stop them by any means necessary? Or is that political violence and the purely symbolic act of voting is the only way we're permitted to resist? Because I think we're way past voting. So next video, we'll talk about how to fight back.